Buster Rhymes has his first classic album ever, 30 years into his career. I think hip hop will always be a void for the people. Yo, I'm fired up this week, man. I am fired up because hip hop got something great, like truly great. Um, you know, I've always respected Buster, you know, um, and I've, I've been a fan of his music and, and him, but never the biggest fan, right? Like, so scenario, you know, everyone went crazy over that verse. My verse was, my favorite verse was always from Fife, you know. Um, Same. There are records that he's had, put your hands uh, where your eyes can see, um, you know, and give me some more and some other records where I've like flipped out, you know. Um, there have been remixes and guest verses like what he did on the Rigor Mortis verse with Kendrick and um, and Look At Me Now, uh, you know, the Chris Brown record. Mm -hmm. there, there have been verses where I've just been like, yo, this dude is so underappreciated, so underrated. And there have been records like um, uh, The Ghetto. Um, you know, when it was the ghetto. On, on Big Bang, you mean the Rick James joint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In The Ghetto, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I love that record where, you know, he's understated but still crazy. So I've been a fan over the years. But um, when I started listening to this record, so the, the first drop I heard was the Kendrick record. Um, you know, and well, that's not true. I mean, you and I in, in passing, and I don't mean to stop you, but we, we've talked about a couple of the Lucy's that have made their way onto the album, the Anderson joint and the Vibes Cartel track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't realize those were part of the album. Right. You right. Know, I, okay. I thought those were just Lucy's and wasn't thinking of them like in, in that term. But like but when when this song Look Over Your Shoulder came out, first of all, like um, I don't recall. Do you recall a Kendrick verse this year? No, this is the first. You know. So it's the first Kendrick verse, right? So that, that's noteworthy. But then the sample, Michael Jackson, like Jackson 5, I can't even like begin to think about how hard it was to like secure that, you know, from a cost perspective, legally, the whole nine. But the way it was chopped up, everything about the record was so compelling. But then Busta came in and smashed it too. And then for the album to drop just a day later, um, I went in with high expectations, but also, you know, never having been a big fan of Busta albums, you know, didn't really, you know, think there was going to be, I thought it would be good, like most hip hop records would have three or four bangers and that would be it, you know, mm -hmm. rip the ones from the play for the, for the play uh, playlist and that would be it. Um, but I want to stop there. Do you, do you, are there Busta albums that you play front to back and go back to again and again? You know, everything you said is wild because I find Busta's very polarizing and I've always held him in the highest regard. Um, you know, he's one of the, you know, the most durable artists in hip hop. I mean, and, and really fits into any circle. You know, he can do the, the Barbarians, but also, you know, can make records with Janet and Mariah that stand the test of time. To me, um, the Big Bang Theory, or <laughs> Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang with uh, the 2006 album that he made on Aftermath. Um, that is, that is the standout in his catalog that at least every year I'll come back to. And then there's joints like you and I are both fans of like New York shit that will, that are on that album that will continue to play. Um, but even that one, you know, I don't come back to it the way that I might with, you know, a reasonable doubt or, you know, a section 80 or, you know, uh, paid in full like that. So very similar relationship to the one you're talking about. And when you play that record, do you play it front to back or are there tracks you go to and you skip around? I play it front to back because I always thought it was the magnum opus of Busta's catalog till it came out. And also 2006, that was the year I graduated college. That was, a, in my opinion, a great year in hip hop. And it's one of those albums that I'll play to kind of turn back time for an hour, you know, and okay. just remember the way that it felt. But again, you know, I don't put that album in the class of, and there's a reason why you don't hear that come up with even some of the other albums that came out that year, like King by T.I. or Fish Scale by Ghost, or, you know, it's a different type of album, but Donuts by Dilla or Hip Hop is Dead, Nas. Would you call that album a classic? Um, no, no. I think it was up until this week, and you and I might disagree on when it's appropriate to call something classic, 
But up until this week, I would stand on two feet that that was Busta's best solo album. His best solo album, but not yeah. necessarily a classic. Correct. Okay. We've talked about this before. There are a lot of great artists that don't have classic albums. And I, I liken it to NBA players, right? There, there's a lot of great players who never got a ring, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and the ones who did, and especially when they're the lead players, I'm not talking about role players who benefited from it, right? Like a Robert Ori. I'm talking about the guys who like won you the ring. Yeah. Once you get that, right? The John you're Stockton's, a, you know. Yeah, you're, you're in a different class, right? right. A player, like it, you separate yourself and your legacy is in a different place than most other players. Now, if you're fortunate enough or good enough or both to get multiple rings, then you start to become like legendary, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, but there are, are phenomenal players, you know, Charles Barkley, um, you know, uh, Patrick Ewing, tons of phenomenal players that never got rings, but but they're still great players, right? So uh, when, when, when I say a person doesn't have a classic, it's not a disparagement. It's actually just uh, like a really rare achievement for you to get a classic. Mm -hmm. So I don't think the Buster Rhymes has had a classic album before. Um, but this album, I put it on and, you know, the first song comes on and I'm listening and, you know, the intro and Chris Rock is on, ominous. There's like four minutes or five minutes of just talking, right? And then Busta comes in with a verse that is like prophetic and like, you know, um, you know, just ominous and just like unbelievably great. And then Rakim follows up and, you know, it, it is, it's, it's unreal. It's like, and this is the record, this is the, this is the one with the, um, uh, and Pete Rock too. Yeah, like, Pete know, does like, his. It, flits, it switches yeah. over to like, the world is yours, you know, the Nas track, and seamlessly. And these two were just smashing it, like. And then you know, uh oh, uh oh, something, something, something important yeah. is about to happen, something special. And then I hear the second record, right? And it is the Purge, um, a Swiss Beats joint. And that record's incredible. And then I hear the third, and it's produced by Jay Dilla and Pete Rock, Strap Yourself Down. And then I have, hear the fourth, and it's Rock Wilder featuring the MLP. And dude, it kept going, and it was around, let me see, where was it? It was around um, record number eight with Q-Tip, Don't mm -hmm. Go, where I started to get a feeling. You know, there's a feeling that you have when you're witnessing something great unfold. And like, it's both awe and it's also like, kind of like a, an anxiety. There's an anxiety and I have, I've been searching for the word and I just found that there's an anxiety because you don't know if it's gonna be able to sustain. And I think about it like, for you, you're a baseball dude, right? So when you're watching a no hitter unfold and you get to around the seventh inning or it, it, I'm going to say a perfect game even, right? Like yeah. you run the seventh inning and like, you know, uh, you start to get that tingling feeling, you know what I mean? And yeah. you start to wonder, you start to question, but you don't know if it can happen or not. And you're just so locked in and so present to it, like a, a bowler bowling a 300 or watching LeBron drop like, you know, 30 in the last quarter and like, you know, double overtime in that piston series. Like um, you start to understand that you're witnessing something great and when like it got to track eight I started to have that feeling and I couldn't believe it because you know I never anticipated it from Busta I didn't anticipate it because it's just so hard to get a classic now and people just don't like apply that level of excellence to their craft mm -hmm. to make every single song count and you know and it's so long too I was like okay there's no way it can sustain for 12 more songs or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, I get to the Rick Ross joint, um, you know, track number 10, and it's called True Indeed. And, or actually, uh, night before I get to the True Indeed, which is produced by DJ Premier. You just like a quick, like less than two minutes, you know, yeah. just like boom, yeah. And then I get to Master Far Muhammad with this produced by High Tech and, and you know, Terrence Martin, and it's featuring mm -hmm. Rick Ross. and. Then I get to the Anderson Pack record and 
you know, Mary J. And it just keeps going on and on and on and on. And you got tracks by Ninth Wonder and, you know, DJ Scratch and Knotts is all over it. Knotts is killing it. Yeah. Busta. And I said, oh, Busta Rhymes has his first classic album ever, 30 years into his career. And, you know, first of all, you and I are about to fight, I think, because <laughs> he has album of the year. He has the album of the year. I, I put this above Benny. Okay. I put it above Royce. No disrespect. I love mm -hmm. both of those dudes. And they both put out great bodies of work. But this is the album of Buster Rhymes' lifetime, his career, and is one of the best albums I've heard in years. Man, I see why you wore the prime hoodie. You just uh, you <laughs> came. <laughs> no. um, I won't fight you on that, man. I This album, you know, sort of like the word classic, which we can talk about, that I feel like it's thrown around a little bit loosely in hip hop. I feel that comeback gets thrown around. Like, you know, people already be like, oh man, it's been a minute since, you know, we had Kendrick. I'm like, yo, he, he takes his time. Cole takes his time. Busta took 11 plus years. And this album, as you pointed out to me in an article that, that we'll talk about more, I'm sure, this album was 20 years in the making. Like that intro track, you know, um, which you make a case because I'm like, if that could sit for a decade and still sound brand new, and I don't know if Bus, you know, read it his verse and went to Rakim. I tend to think not because Rakim's talking about the seventh seal, which had just come out in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, you've built a body of work that can stand the test of time. As far as album of the year, I really like one of the things I love about this time of year is, you know, now that the albums have started to come out in full, I will take this album, take Royce, take Benny, take Apollo Brown and Shea Noir, take Jay Electronica and sit with them and really decide because it's just fun. It's fun to make hip hop competitive, but I'm not mad at that take at all. I think Busta truly set the highest bar. And I think that, you know, this album is, you know, I sat on this podcast a few months ago and I was like, man, why did he make ELE the sequel? You know, Busta has better albums than Extinction Level Event. Yo, it all makes sense now. Like, Oh, to put sense. this out before the election, to put this out in like the most messed up year that I think we can all agree on, yeah. you know, it makes sense. And um, what's really dope to me about this album, I do think, you know, I do think there's flaws. I don't think that Vibes Cartel song needs to be on this album. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, this is 22 tracks long, an hour and 17 minutes. I think that you know, if you would have brought in some of the best ARs in the game, they would have pulled back four or five songs. But we're living in these times, and I'm sure that as I say that, there's people that tune in on this podcast, and they go, no, I love that one, because that's the song that taps into Busta's, you know, dance hall vibe, or his, you know, this, this chamber that he's got. But what I really think is so amazing about this album is it's a playlist. You know, even from the intro to the homage to... Um, you know, the world is, uh, you know, the world is yours to the old dirty bastard recycled vocal to tapping into some tribe references to the MOP references to what he does with Belle Biv DeVoe, you know, like four years ago when Drake did that and started to make these albums that were almost like DJ playlists, Busta did that and he did it in the illest way. Like even on the Kendrick joint, the Jackson 5 sam sam sample, excuse me, begins coming out of deep thought into the young God speaks and then it completely builds into look over your shoulder like you know this is an audio experience that I'm not really used to I mean it feels like an incredible mixtape but of an album quality yeah I mean the out of my mind joint where he chops up that Belle Viv DeVoe poison sample is just I mean and the beat is so monstrous and the way he attacks it is so aggressive it's amazing you know so the Don and the Boss, the Vibes Cartel joint, is one that I actually um, really like. And uh, the only record that I would say, like, I got to give a few more listens to is Satanic, the very mm. last record, you know. Um, but even that, like, substantively, I know is, like, really, really, you know, on a higher level. So I'm wondering, how many times have you listened to it? I am on three and a half. So I did, th did three full and then I earmark some tracks that I keep coming back to. You know, mm -hmm. I've done that before, where especially 22 tracks long, um, you know, there's some that I've just wanted. And I was like, I can't wait. I can't wait an hour. I need to hear it again. Like, 
you mentioned the Mary J song, um, You Will Never Find Another Me, which, you know, if this is the last Buster Rhymes album, which at no point is it mentioned, you know, that is, that is such an amazing song. And that's not an energy that I typically seek out in Busta. You know, I'm more in the spiritual, lyrical, miracle stuff. And that is like a, you know, a real kind of testament to what he is as a person as well as an artist. And Mary J, as she did all throughout the 90s and early 2000s, you know, comes in and, and just, you know, shows why she's the queen of, of what she does. Yeah. So you mentioned the Vulture article. Uh, shout out to uh, Craig Jenkins, who did a phenomenal interview of Busta. Um, so he talks about the fact that the, the, the first record, is, the Notch production, is one that he's had for 22 years. And he did that intentionally because he wanted this to sound like it, like uh, it picks off right where extinction, ex extinction level event one left off. Just that kind of thought and intention put into it shows you uh, that he was looking to craft something that he believed to be like his best work. And you can see in the interview that the Busta like truly believes this. You know, he talks about learning patience and he called this from 868 records, right? Yeah. Like so. It's 20 something, but from 868, like just the, the patience, the discipline, the focus to be able to do something like that is amazing. And then, you know, he talks also about how he got the best out of everyone that he worked with. You know, he got that My Life, Mary. Um, you know, he and Kendrick, you know, the Rigor Mortis remix was bananas. Like That, that Kendrick was, sounds on the album. I mean, you're, you are a Kendrick fanatic, you know, yeah. more than anyone I know. It, doesn't sound like the newest Kendrick. And yeah. I'm happy about that. Yeah, I'm wondering if, well, okay. So to me, it sounds like, um, it does sound like three, four year old Kendrick, right? I don't know what Kendrick sounds like right now. None of us do. No, Because no, yeah. we haven't heard anything, you know, really new in a long time. We've heard like, you know, slight verses here and there. But the change ups, you know, like he, he starts off a certain way and just the slowdowns and the, 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 you know, starting back up again. Um, it's very much in that damn kind of mode, you know. So I'm guessing this verse is, is probably around that era, like three, four. But he also sounds very sharp, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think he was in fighting weight. So I think it was probably when he was making that album that, that, that he did this. I venture to bet even before that, this sounds to me like middle of the decade, like, to pimp a butterfly Kendrick. And what's so interesting is, you know, Dr. Dre's always talked about that, like telling his artists don't make topical references. And, you know, that Vulture article was illuminating to me because, you know, I mean, Gabusta has gone 11 years, but this album doesn't sound dated in any way like that, lyrically or musically. And it's, yeah. you know, I know this word has turned into a, a hip hop journalism cliche, but even at 22 songs, it's very cohesive. You know. And it's the first time we worked with DJ Premier, which mm -hmm. is insane. That I know of, yeah. Uh, well, he says it on the record, you know. Mm, um, word, yes. And, and Primo brought a beat that, that that doesn't sound like Primo. You know, the drums sound different. The bass line's a little bit funkier. I not it sounded like way. Primo sounds, to me. It sounds fantastic. But, you know, it's not. What yeah. I'm trying to say is that it's not a um, formulate Primo beat. Primo mm. brought, brought his A game and crafted a sound for, for Busted, you know. Um, yeah. And then, you know, he's got the record with Nia. Rick Ross is in the pocket, like just sounding incredible on it. Him and Q-Tip smash it, you know, on Don't Go. Dude, like, um, it's a special record. And everyone I turned on to it, I, I turned a few people onto it uh, over the weekend. And like, it took a little while, but everyone came back saying, yo. And people, like, people I haven't heard from in a minute hit me up saying, hey man, you hear this record like it is yeah. it's special like and when you can have something like that drop for hip-hop especially in a year like this in a time like this and for an artist that has been around for 30 years you know we talk about Royce you know making his best music now we talk about Black Thought making his best music now both those dudes are you know Royce is like 20 years in um Black Thought probably like 25 a little more than 25 um Black Thought hasn't made a classic uh right now he's made he said classic verses and stuff, but he hasn't. He made classics with the roots, though. No, no, but I'm saying he hasn't put together a classic body of work at this stage in his career right now. Word. Okay. Body, the full body of work. Like, I don't know that anyone, well, first of all, there's very few people who've been around for 30 years, right? Yeah. But I don't know of anyone who's put a classic together this late in their career. You know, um, 
you know, Jay, I would say 444 was a classic, you know, 25 years into his career. Um, Royce, you know, I'd say Book of Ryan. Um, but 30 years out, I don't know, it's been done before. I'll be anxious to see. I mean, you know, clearly, you know, there's two months left in the year, but every time Buster puts his best foot forward, it kind of gets lost in the sauce. I feel like that happened with Big Bang in 2006. I personally think that, you know, the coming and when disaster strikes are very good albums. But I mean, in 96, you had Pac, you had Reasonable Doubt, you had, you know, all of these movements and Busta made hits for sure. But when it comes time to, you know, and I don't, I don't measure that in a Grammy, but when we talk about the Hallmark albums of a year, most definitely, regardless of what happens with, with what's left in the year, this will be one of the ways we remember 2020. And that's why, even though I really pumped the brakes on the, on the C word, on classic, um, this is one, one time where, especially after understanding the context of how long this album sits around, it, you can make the case. And I definitely think we should, you know, this is what it means to have a comeback in hip hop. Not, yo, I, I, you know, I put out a mixtape and, you know, it's been a three years since an album. This is a comeback. This is a decade plus. And let's not forget, back on, back on my BS in 2009 was, you know, probably the ugly stepchild in Busta's catalog. And I think he admits that himself. So to come back this strong over this much time is uh, truly remarkable. And I think it's dope too. Like Busta didn't do what Jay did. He didn't do what a lot of artists are doing. This isn't a, I'm more mature Busta Rhymes. This is a, I'm going to do what I've always done at a higher level Busta Rhymes. Yeah. You know, so let, let's talk about your, your uh, concept of timeliness. So I think that he was very intentional on in doing certain things to make sure this lasted the test of time. So one is um, the Chris Rock skits, right? So he's got Chris Rock literally talking about like his timelessness and like the death of his catalog and like he's a human iPod and all these things. So really cementing his legacy throughout, right? Like just a reminder of like, you know, how great he is and like memorializing and articulating. I think that's one. Two is, um, you know, the interludes and the theme. So like having Minister Farrakhan at a time when he's 86 years old and we don't know like how much longer he's going to be with us and saying the incredible, incredible, powerful things that he's saying that are generational. You know, he's saying things that really deeply apply to this year, mm -hmm. but they're themes that like are like universal to human existence and have been around for quite some time. And I think are gonna be prophetic, but also um, summary in, in the way that, they, that he's describing things. Um, and then you have the overall theme of a new world order. And, you know, when you go back and look at you know, the predictions of Busta made with extinction level of it and the artwork of like lower Manhattan being on fire three years before September 11th. And when you really go back and think about how much our lives have changed since, you know, September 11th and even just from TSA to being normal to walk around Grand Central with, you know, military people with like AR-15s and like, you know, assault weapons. Um, these are things that were not normal before 2001 and we don't even think about it anymore. We don't see it, we don't, you know, um, and 2020 is going to be that hard reset too. So I think that there are things that he did with this album very intentionally that will make it, you know, last the test of time and maybe be even more valuable. Like I need to go back and, and listen to the first ELE now to like really like peep the game that the dude was spent 22 years ago, given like how incredible this album is. Yeah. So there's that, um, you know, and so the classic thing. So I wrote an article you know, on AFH. Actually, this might have been before you, which is like, it's like a month before remember. I started. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. You know, it was before you because it was about Good Kid, Mad City. Mm -hmm. And it was about like, um, about being very careful about using the term classic. Like, I can't think of a classic, an album that I would call a classic since Damn. Uh, for me, you know, um, I would say the Book of Ryan was Royce's best album. Um, I'm not sure that I would say it's classic, but so, so, so definition of classic for me is, is um, it's got to be um, sonically cohesive, like, and so um, if not thematic in terms of substance, 
it's got to sound like it's all part of one body of work instead of just like a mishmash of like, you know, beats that are crafted. It's got to be, un it's got to be unskippable. And I'll give maybe one or two, right, skips, but generally unskippable. You listen to it from front to back and there's no need to like move. You just, you just listen to it. Um, and then it's got to be something that stands the test of time. And the test of time is something you can't know of the moment. You have to wait for years to understand whether or not it's a classic. But I think there are some things that we, we can hear and, and project out and believe that they will transcend and, and, it's, and last. You know, I, I knew a good kid would be a classic. Like, and I, and I, I said that within like, you know, five days or so. And then we did that piece about five years later. It's a time to call it a classic. And it, when, when people first said it, they said it was crazy. But five years later, people was like, it's obvious, of course, it's yeah. who said it wasn't, you know? So um, I think this hits those criteria, but, but what do you think? No, I agree with that. And I think that, you know, the danger is all of us, whatever the social media channel is, you know, we turn into an ecosystem where we, where that word is just thrown around and you and I, and, and this isn't, you know, to toot our own horns, but we don't, you know, that's part of what the ambrosia for heads credo was, is we don't use that word um, you know, until it's right. And I, I do agree. In the last two years, the one caveat I might say is Rhapsody's Eve. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that might be classic. It is those things that you said, you know, it is cohesive. It's, it's sonically excellent, but it will be an album that, that fits into a celebration of black women and a, and a important, um, assertion of women in society, you know, but especially black women. And I feel like as we look at where the world is finally moving to, that album is an important soundtrack. So that is a caveat, but I do. I mean, you make a really good case with Busta and ELE too. Like this album just fits in. And I think you said something really interesting too. The way I remember Extinction Level Event 1, it was this lofty, I was in high school. It was this lofty album. It was, it had a few joints, but I skipped over a lot of, I think the thematic intention that he put into that album. I haven't, you know, this came out on Friday. We're just a few days in. I haven't done it yet. But the fact that this album made me want to go back to another body of work that I kind of mentally disregarded and by and large is an incredible statement given the saturation of the market. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I really, really, really think this is something special. And, um, you know, for all the major movements that Bus has been attached to, Native Tongues, Dre and Aftermath, Cash Money for a minute and Young Money. And, you know, he had his own, you know, Violator movement, which he talks about on the album. This one comes independently. You know, this one is, you know, and it was two years ago that we heard that Dr. Dre was overseeing it. There's not one Dre beat on the album. There's a few that sound like they have that mix to it. But right, there's no, there's no Dre production. No, here. no Dre production. No Dre production. You know, which is kind of like a Kendrick phenomenon of like, yo, Dre's in the mix somewhere, but we don't know where, but it has that stamp of quality, which is really interesting. And yeah, I mean, Scratch and Knots um, are right there. And Busta, who I didn't, I never consider as an artist producer, he produced some of the best joints on the album. I know, you know? I didn't realize it either, but yeah, he smashed it. Uh, so Dre, you know, he mentions in that article that Dre taught him patience and that, you know, prior to working with Aftermath, he you know released basically an album a year, and he had mm -hmm. never waited three years to release an album. But but Dre taught him that patience, that discipline, and it extended into um, his physical. That's when he got in shape, and just learning that kind of discipline um, really changed it. So Dre is present on this, you know, just in his mentality. But you bring up yeah. a good point about Rhapsody, you know, and uh, you know, shout out to Rap. Like I, I agree with that. I, th I do think Eve is a classic, um, and it got lost in the sauce. I'm glad to see that, that playlist um that uh, called some of its songs this past summer like started to get a, a little bit more run but that was you know i had like five or six songs from that project on our playlist at mm -hmm. one time and it was really hard to pick you know same with this buster record i put like three or four maybe four or five and dude i could have put eight like I mean, yeah but like i just didn't want to overwhelm the playlist and i, I gotta remember to go back and like switch them out but um rhapsody's on this album too and it's interesting because she raps from the perspective of um, you know, the mother of Buster's child who like kind of did him wrong, you know, when, when their child was younger. And it's mm -hmm. interesting to hear her take that, you know. Um, but she had a tremendous week too, um, this week. Um, she was lyricist of the year 
but uh, for the BT Hip Hop Awards, it's the first time she's ever gotten any kind of like trophy like that. Um, you know, it's crazy. Like, um, you know, uh, first of all, it's amazing she got lyricist of the year, and I can't remember the last time or if there's ever been a time that a woman got that. You know, but mm. what do you think about that? Why do you think that um, it's taken so long for people to give rap that recognition on a mainstream level? Yeah, I mean, it's just you know, it's not a sexy answer sometimes, you know what I mean? And, and I was really happy because the BET Awards happened, um, you know, they aired after the AMA, you know, American Music Awards nominees. And that was just very baby Roddy Rich leaning. Um, you know, rap, you know, competed against the baby. you know, um, it's North Carolina rivalry. And, you know, especially when you're dealing with television, I mean, you have a background in this, I mean, big background, but you always expect, you know, the media darlings to get it. And Rhapsody is somebody who, you know, just chips away, makes it happen, does, you know, puts her best foot forward. So to watch that happen um, is, is really, really good, especially when Eve, in my opinion, was snubbed, snubbed at the Grammys and, you know, Layla's Wisdom did not win. Everyone was happy when it was nominated for a Grammy, but it didn't come home a winner. So, you know, it's just... Rhapsody, I've heard her say it herself, but trust the process. And, you know, it, this is a big award and a deserved award when you looked at that list. Um, so I'm happy to see it. And I hope, uh, you know, it's the first of many for rap. Yeah, it was a big night for uh, women in general. You know, Megan Thee Stallion took home was the Artist of the Year Award, um, which, which is phenomenal. And then they had that cipher with Brandy, her... Um, Tiana Erica Taylor. and Tiana Taylor over the um, I Want to Be Down remix and they yeah. all just smashed it. Wow, that yeah. was incredible. I, I watched I it like 10 times. To, like, I, wanted to, yeah, I, mean, I wanted to embed that. I wanted to like actually like dust off the, um, the, the Parfit moniker and like put together a little like a uh, pulse and, and share that one because that was incredible, you know. Um, it, it really was. And, and you and I talked about it, you know, with all that's going on election season 2020 you know the awards crept up on me and, and they're obviously later than they usually are by about three weeks and um you know so i didn't tune in live and when you sent that to me i was like oh shit yeah 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 it was crazy like normally that would be one of our biggest tent poles right and i still got the the, the embeds for the email for the embeds um uh, in, in my inbox, but it wasn't even on my radar until that day. Like I was listening to a breakfast club and DC Young Fly was on there promoting. And I didn't even know he hosted, I haven't seen any the clips yeah. of that, but um, yeah, I didn't even, it wasn't even on my radar at all. Was it, was it on your radar this year? No, honestly, with all that's going on, you know, you and I are both living lives right now. And that was obviously in the midst of, you know, what it, what was happening in Philadelphia, the neighborhood was on lockdown and uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't, and yeah, I I still haven't watched the show in full. I've watched a lot of clips from it. So is that you and me being less plugged in than we have before, or is that it losing relevance or some of both? And there was a song, someone recently, I can't remember who it was, in the last four weeks or so, had a line about like uh, not needing it, like the BET Hip Hop Awards. Yeah. You know that you remember somebody, somebody. It's on our playlist. Uh, yeah, I've heard it, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to think who. You yeah. Know? So like, it's not just in our heads, right? Is, is, is it? Is it? Wasn't Big Sean? Less, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe it was. Yeah. Maybe it was on that record. Um, the um, the Benny record um, with Big Sean and, and Wayne. Um, I think it's both. I mean, it's 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 really interesting. I don't know. I mean, this week has been a wild one because I am convinced we are headed back for, you know, a nationwide lockdown in response to COVID. And, you know, I feel like everyone is trying to get one more drop of life out before it goes away. You know, whether you're you're comfortable going indoors or out, um, there's just this looming and then there's all this election anxiety. And whereas you know, we saw this with Versus, you know, early this year, people had their undivided attention. People were sitting at home, stir crazy, like here, entertain me. But by the end of October, everyone's in a different headspace. People are protesting again. People are, you know, canvassing, they're waiting in line, they're doing this and that. And I just feel like it came at a really rough time for the awards. But the beautiful thing is, unlike 20 years ago, you can go watch them. I don't, I don't question the relevance. And if anything, you know, watching people like Rhapsody get their moment 
makes me makes my buy in so I don't miss it next year um, that much stronger. But yeah, you and I, I'm, I'm still on reprieve of like, I don't have to follow this anymore. I want to for the podcast and I certainly obsess as a fan. But when it comes to things like that, I'm OK if there's a good, you know, something else happening in my life. Yeah, you know, I watched uh, I watched probably five or six clips from it. Um, I watched the uh, cipher with Jack Harlow and Rhapsody, and Jack Harlow, dude, I, I'm a fan. Like that dude, he just released his song Tyler. He wrote that dude can rap. Uh, his song with Big Sean uh, with that sorry with problem. problem with problem is dope. Um, I really actually like his flow a lot. Um, so he was he was dope. Um, he had some conscious things to say too. Rhapsody was nice, um, and then I watched one with the baby and Megan the stallion and that was pretty much it you know there, there wasn't much more that like uh, appealed to me yeah no that i mean that was cool yeah you've you've made me because initially some of my you know more hardcore hip-hop fans have been like clowning jack harlow to me and i knew that you know i think he's a freshman right um is it maybe I'm, maybe maybe not but i mean He's just been buzzing around like that. And then you put me on to the problem song and I liked him on there. I was like, man, you know what? Like dude's working with problem. This is pretty cool. And then, yeah, I mean, you've, you've added Jack to the playlist and uh, you know, that's your guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> I see. Uh, look, yeah. So speaking of the document, man, I'm looking and like uh, I had the headline in there. Um, but, but you, uh, you kind of were capping in there. So like, did you get out what you need to say? I want you like holding back. You guys <laughs> no, I, like, just, I just, wanna, I just want to, let's get into I, it. I don't want us to be one of those people. And, and, you know, for folks of us that are only following or only new to the party, I just want to make it clear. We're not, we're not among the troops out here that throw the C word around and call everything a classic, you know, after one listen or, you know, just to try to get the timeline hot. That's just not who you are, and it's not who I am. So the fact that you're 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 stepping on this hill and planting the flag and saying, "Yo, this is a classic album," and it's one of the first in the last three, four, five years, really since Damn. Um, yo, I'm I'm not mad at you. I won't fight you on that. You know, yo, and and I, I, so here's my honest response, right? Like, uh, and everything I've said has been honest, by the way. But yeah. like, um, I just thought of this. Um, the Source magazine, right? You and I grew up. It was the Bible, the authority on hip hop. Um, they had to give five mics when it was appropriate, right? Five mics is a classic album, and they were sparing with it. And sometimes they didn't give five mics when they should have, like the Chronic mm -hmm. and uh, you know records like that. But they had to, in the moment, acknowledge a classic when a classic was there. Yeah. So, and so, so you don't have the benefit. Sometimes you have to go out on a limb and if it's there, say it and be bold enough to stand on it and let time, let others see in time what you see in the moment, you know? And so like, I'm, I'm planting that flag. It's a that's, that's a really dope point too. Cause I know, you know, one of the things, and this was controversial at the source, but one of the things that I lived through is, you know, what to do with the minstrel show when little brother came out with that in 2005 and, you know, I think people were so used to using the C word with A-list artists, which as much as the internet and the backpack community and the indie community loved LB, you know, we were very like, what do we do? And this was a great album. And, and there were people, some of them that worked at the source, some of them that are our friends that came out and said, yo, this is classic. I was at all hip hop at the time and we gave it a perfect review, you know? Um, and yeah, so you got to take that chance. And I don't think you or I are saying that this is a perfect album from Busta. But, you know, classic, especially given the theme, the effort, you know, all of that, and accepting the fact that you said that there's going to be two or three songs that you skip over. Um, yeah. And you and I, you know, we talk about All Eyes on Me, and you came up with a really dope headline, you know, a few years ago that it's the last, last flawed classic hip hop album. And there are more than, I mean, it's a double album, but there's more than four songs on All Eyes on Me that I skip over and have skipped over for 24 years. Um, and I still consider that a classic, so. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I consider it a classic, but of Pac's catalog, I think it's probably the closest in sheer volume. I think in density, I would give it to me against the world, but yeah. yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that, you know, and I would venture to say both are classic, but also part of what makes All Eyes On Me 
not to get on a tangent, but part of it is, you know, that was the time in life. Like that was like, you are watching Pac almost burn up in real time, you know, and that's, it's hard to listen to, but you can hear the triumph and the tragedy across those two discs, knowing that, you know, what in less than nine months after it released, um, well, less than seven, he'd be gone. You know? Yeah. And Buster's career precedes Tupac's man. That, that's, that's crazy. That's the context to put into like how incredible it is. He's done this 30 years into the game. You know? Yeah. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, on that set, I was thinking about it this morning and a lot of people, I think Greg Nice or Easy Mo B had told me that, you know, Busta was one of the people that Pac recruited for One Nation and, you know, along with Smith and Wesson and Black Moon and some other people, you know, Bust and his protege at the time were headed to LA and maybe even there. And like, so Bust is in that, he's in native tongues. He gets his name from Chuck D, you know, who named him after a football player, if I'm not mistaken. Like he's there for Dre, he's there. like, Busta has just, you know, seen it all and done it all. Like, you know, like Jay, like Nas, maybe even more so, you know, um, and that's so, you know, so interesting. Yeah. You know, going back to your Benny point, so like two or three other people hit me like uh, from different pockets saying that they also thought it was the album of the year to that point. That Busta uh, was? No, 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 no. Uh, the, the Benny, Benny was. Yeah. The Benny was. So, look, uh, you know, I, I, would have, I wouldn't have been mad at you running that clip. Like, I've yeah. been cool with that, you know. Because, um, you know, maybe there, there was that argument at the time. You know, there was definitely the argument, for sure, yeah. you know. Uh, I don't think anyone would have looked, looked at it sideways, you know. It would have piqued mm-hmm. curiosity and maybe sparked debate, but I don't think anyone could push back and say it was ridiculous. No, and, and I mean, you know, Royce and Busta are in a different class to me. I mean, I'm not, albums are albums. But it's sort of like to use your complete game analogy, your perfect game analogy. Like this is nine innings. Royce is nine innings. Benny came out and did like, you know, it's a it's six a quick, and a half. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like a really good closer, a really good, you know. Um, but Busta and Royce put it on the line and they had, you know, I'm not gonna say more to say because Benny, you know, has never stepped out like this, but it's a really interesting dichotomy in hip hop right now yeah. of of that. And of, of those three albums and, and, you know, close behind that, that trio, Shane Noir and Apollo, like the quality of music is really interesting and it's coming from places that, you know, go beyond just profile. Yeah. Well, the lyrical content though, too, like, you know, so I think Kendrick, when I listen to Damn, I hear Kendrick trying to make the world better. Like he's trying to impart messages that like make people's lives better and that you know mm-hmm. and i feel the same way in extinction level of it like buster is giving jewels he, he's very uh, explicit about it you know and saying look I, I weave this into classic material to give you you know knowledge and it's that's you know that's the ethos of ambrosia for heads like and put the medicine in the food like really try and deliver value in what people consume and so it just resonates with me differently yeah for sure um, you know, so going back to the hip hop awards real quick. So D Nice, DJ of the Year. That was, Never that was that, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it, that's the right. The, the, oh, changed 100%. He changed everything, he changed yeah. everything you know, yeah. um, for all of us speaking about lockdown. He made lockdown bearable. Like that was one of the first rays of hope, in, you know, during what was a really uncertain and dark time, you know. So shout out to him, Hip Boy, producer of the year. <laughs> yeah. I know you put that in there for my satisfaction. I, I did, you. man. I appreciate you, man. Pause. I appreciate, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you on that. Um, but that's right, though. Somebody else hit me this weekend too. One of my, um, um, someone that I work with, um, uh, saying that like he, uh, you know, he was so happy to see. Uh, both Nas and Busta deliver some of their best work uh, like at this stage of their careers this year, you know, and Hit Boy obviously had a big hand in the Nas piece and also your album of the year piece, like, you know, so the Benny, so yeah, I, I can't see anybody else who should get that over him. No, I mean, like I said, my trio behind him, you got Alchemist and you have uh, Royce himself. And and maybe I got to really look, Knotts deserves so much recognition for this Busta album. And, you know, Knotts has been doing it. But yeah, Hip Boy coming on this. And then, you know, Hip Boy put out a single this week with uh, with what, Gibbs and is it Sean? Mm, I haven't heard it yet. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, how was it? It's not... 
like he's been doing on those albums, but you know, that I'm not taking anything away from Hit either, you know. Okay. What, you know. All right. Um, you know, so TI versus Jeezy. Uh, you mentioned King earlier. Yeah. Uh, that was a definitive album for that era. Jeezy has some definitive albums for that era too. I think it was TI, Jeezy, and Ross when I think of mid 2000s, mm -hmm. uh, mid to late 2000s, and Kanye, like who, who kind of ran that time in the decade, you know, um, Eminem yeah. too, but like he was starting to wane after like 2003, 2004, no pun intended. Wayne, um, and then um, 50. But but T.I. and Jeezy from the South were, were those guys, you know, that, 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 that dope boy rap. So them in a versus that's happening on November 19th. Um, you think that's going to be a top three versus, first of all? I don't know. I mean, we'll see where the world is. That That is a huge factor. If we're all in lockdown and going crazy, absolutely. If, if not, I don't know. Um, I think I don't, and I'm a bigger fan of T.I. than I am Jeezy. And, you know, T.I. has gotten himself in a little bit of hot water. You know, he originally, there was talk of Busta versus T.I. And then T.I. made comments about, well, what, you know, is, to your point, like, can we do Busta's career overlapping mine, like those years? Are we going to include L.O.N.S.? Are we going to do this? But that being said, I, I just feel like T.I.'s catalog goes a lot further than Jeezy's. And that's, that's strictly my opinion. Um, you know, if it goes down, I, I will tune in. But uh, yeah. well, I'm going to well, let me say this. Uh, I would say that solo catalog, yes, but Jeezy's got some crazy cameos. Like, think about his cameos with, his, I mean, his features with Jay, his features with Ross. Like, Jeezy's got some features. I'm so you going, start throwing those in. Yeah. And I know, you know, I think that, that Jeezy has a cult following in a way that I think T.I. may have lost his over the years. You know, there's a lot of people that have canceled T.I. or walked away from him for things that have nothing to do with music, even though his catalog has been a little bit speckled at times. Um, I still think, you know, I don't think that Jeezy has a classic album. I know there's people that believe Thug Motivation 101 is. Um, and I do think that T.I. has two of them in King and Paper Trail. And there's a lot of there's a lot of material on both of those albums, let alone the singles that he had early in his career. And T.I. has been on a lot of big like Khaled records, a lot of features. Yeah, I mean, the Timberlake stuff. T.I., yo, I think T.I. has got it in the bag. That's my opinion. He's super charismatic too. I can see him talking greasy in a slick way, like Babyface was, you know. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, it's gonna be interesting though. I'm sure they'll do it in person, but seeing the two of those dudes in a studio kind of chop it up would be cool too. Yeah, and there's there's really good history there. I mean, in '05, especially before King, and when Jeezy was coming up in the mixtape scene, yeah, there was a lot of comparisons, and then you had, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so speaking of Wayne. Wayne made the news this week too, <laughs> uh, for endorsing outright Donald Trump, photo op, and everything. Um, what do you make of it? You said, first of all, let me ask you this: Do you think the dudes are getting a bag to do this, or do you think that this is their legit like political um, decision? I don't know why Wayne's advisors didn't forewarn him on this one. I mean, literally, like you know, we're we're still hearing the murmurs of aftermath for Cube. And, you know, unlike Cube, Wayne has never really struck me as a political dude, mm -hmm. you know, so to do this, you know, within a week before the election, um, it just came out of left field. I mean, I don't want to like to me to assume that Wayne got a bag for it um, is as ludicrous as people that say that protesters are getting paid to be there. You know what I mean? Like that, what you hear on the you know Fox News agenda. Um, I don't, I don't know, but just the terrible photo op, you know, the thumbs up, the sweater, everything. I'm just like, damn, Dwayne, you know. <laughs> Does this impact his legacy? Or I mean, the stage where people just like, you know, they'll be up in arms one day and then they won't remember it two, two weeks later. I wonder, I mean, I had a few, I had a few folks text me this week as you're talking about Busta that were just like, I'm done with Wayne. I'm done with Wayne. Like, really, because I mean, Wayne made a really good album last year. Um, I don't know that it was a great album. I don't know the last time Wayne made a great album. And, you know, he's always been such a polarizing figure. But I feel like the folks that ride for Wayne, there has to be a fraction of them that are like, not now, not after this. 
No, one of my, my friends uh, from college, his son uh, texted him saying that he couldn't uh, listen to Wayne anymore, that that's going to destroy all of his playlists. Like, so he's going to have to wow. like go back and call like all the Wayne songs. Like, like literally. And this dude is like, uh, he's 18, 19, 19, I think. Yeah. But I mean, you know, shout out to Dana Scott, you know, one of our contributors over the years. And, you know, he did a really good article back in the day a few years ago about James Brown with Nixon. And, you know, people forgave James, but I mean, he had to earn it back, right? Like he had that moment where James Say Brown, I'm I'm black and proud. Boston yeah. Garden, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Wayne probably has to earn it back. And, you know, it was funny, SOHH ran it, so I'm going to call it news. But, you know, supposedly Pusha T got a dig in on Twitter that made me laugh, which is like, yo, you're not down with the Biden tax plan to Wayne but you didn't say this when Birdman was taking all that money from you all those years. Oh, man. And wow. I was, wow. I was laughing. I, it was, it was more push a T than the way I'm paraphrasing, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, like cube, I stand by what you and I said a few weeks ago, like, you know, cube made his point and, you know, stands by it and even says what Biden's representatives are now coming forth and saying is not accurate. Wayne kind of went in for the photo op and, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we'll get a Kanye produced Wayne album next. You know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mr. Carter. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, um, so 50 apparently endorsed him for a hot second and then pulled it back. Do you think that he did that? He pulled it back as a business decision because he saw, he saw the, the ratings for Power Ghostbook 2 going down even further. Man, like, what, I mean, what do you think that was about? I don't know, man. 50 is P.T. Barnum. Like, he, he says ridiculous stuff when there's something to promote. And, you know, it doesn't mean that what 50 said wasn't his truth about, you know, predictions of, of, of tax and all of that. I thought to watch Trump's sons run with that and retweet a Photoshop um, thing of Cuban 50 with MAGA hats on, it's just corny. Like, man, you know, you are, you know, as we all say to each other, we are playing with lives here. And uh, yeah, I just, am, but I don't think people take 50 as seriously as they take Cube. And I don't think anybody expected Wayne to do what he did. So you say that you rule out the, the notion that people might be getting a bag. Why do you throw that out so quickly? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, do those exist like that? I mean, did Jay? No, because I mean, Jay was all in on Obama. You know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, this is so out of reach. Okay, so I'm gonna tee up this. So cameo, you know, yeah. the service cameo. Yeah, I've, I used it to give somebody one thing one time. Yeah. Oh, where would you give? I got my sister. There's this trashy reality show um, on the Wii Network called Love After Lockup. And yeah, it was like 10 bucks. There was a woman on there and I got her to leave my sister like a funny voicemail. It's, it's um, funny that you, people like try to say trashy and stuff, throw people yeah. off the scent that they be watching it. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> true. It's all right, true. man. You ain't got to lie, Craig. I do watch some trashy TV. So. Yeah, anyway, go ahead. Well, go so, ahead. you know, it's been around for, I think it started in 2016, but it's it's gotten traction lately and it's probably because of COVID. Like, um, I think a couple things. One, you know, celebrities are just at home. They don't, they're not out and about, so they have more time on their hands. And then two, like for artists, you can't be out in the road, like making, you know, doing tours and like there's all sorts of like back, backstage experiences. Um, where, you know, fans pay, you know, extra for VIP, like uh, meet and greets and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if um, this is the new uh, version of that, the, the new VIP meet and greet, you know, because I, I was on it, a friend of mine, someone sent her a red man recently and red went out of his way. Like he talked for like three minutes, got real oh, personal, wow. like real intimate details. It was really actually dope, like um, super charismatic. It was great. Um, but then I, I started digging and like I saw Styles P and DJ Jazzy Jeff and E-40 and Ice Cube and Snoop was on there for a minute, D Smoke and tons of others, man. So like, it's a thing. And it's interesting to see like the different like market rates that people charge, you know, there's some in the $75 range, others $500 and everything in between. But what do you, what do you think about that in general? Um, do you think it is a, um, just a cool thing to do? Do you think it's like, like, uh, you know, you know, 
I'm not mad at it. I mean, you know, I come from the era of, you know, one nine hundred numbers in NWA and no limit, you know, CD inserts where supposedly you would get to talk to Master P or, you know, I never did any of that stuff. But yeah, I mean, get your money. It's only fans for famous people. And one day when I got the money, I'm going to get Jack Harlow to give you a call. (laughs) (laughs) Word, no, I got that logic teed up for you. (laughs) (laughs) No, man, I mean, are you mad at it? I think it's a, I think it's a neat concept. And and truly to your point, it wasn't red. Honestly, it was just a woman that was on this reality show that my sister thought was funny, but she went above and beyond. And like, you know, and, and I thought that that was cool. You know, back in the day, it's like getting a drop from an artist. Um, you know, and, and yeah, I just think it's, it's a cool way to monetize and it's no different than, you know, signing a CD after the show, if you bought the CD or whatever. Yeah. You know, I felt a way about it until I saw that clip and then I was like, wow, this is a really viable thing. Like, and this, I I could tell how happy it made her and Mm. it was really cool. So like, it kind of flipped my perspective on it, which is why I wanted to talk about it. But, you know, I started doing the math too. Like if these dudes are banging out like, you know, 10 an hour or something like that. That's thousands of dollars an hour, you know, so. I don't know that it can be that quickly, but what's cool is when you do buy, they tell you how frequently they can record, like the satisfaction of the consumer. Like you get the quality that way. You're not paying like $300 for some artist to be like, oh, yo, hi, Red, you know, Reginald. And then it's like out. Like, no, they put thought into it. And uh, I think it's a, I think it's a really cool service, especially when I know, like I've had conversations with people that it means something to them when they've gotten a retweet or a comment or a like from somebody that they follow. So this takes that social media virtual culture one step further. Word. Yo, so Outcast 20th anniversary for Stankonia. Yeah, man. Um, You would ask, is Stankonia Outcast peak album? Uh, What's your argument for being a peak album? The answer to me is, um, is it their peak album or is it their best album? What, What do you mean by peak, by the way? I think I think Stankonia is a really cool album because it was outcast built every time, you know, like, you know, and they were four albums in. You mean, is it one day peak? Yeah, but it's I don't mean that in a disrespectful way either. I just feel like you look at four album runs and cast, um, you know, I will say that four album run. I mean, I'm just, you know, flying off the cuff here, but I think it's it's. I don't think you can find a better one in hip hop, right? Like even even De La, who I love, or Gangstar, maybe with Gangstar, maybe with Tribe, but they, you know, Cast did it one, two, three, four, and Stankonia, as their audience and their profile grew, it completely delivered, and they still were rapping and making music that sounded like five, ten years ahead of itself. There's only one artist, other artist that I can think of that's done it. And that's, yeah, that's it. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think it's their best album. You know, no. for me, um, Southern Playlistic Cadillac music is still just like that joint just to this day moves me. And then Aquemini, mm. uh, I think is, is also like uh, just top notch. Um, you know, I'll put this and um, uh, Atlians, you know, below those two, but. Yeah, ATL Eons is always my favorite album, which is funny because I love you know, upbeat, fast tempo, like St. Konya. I mean, when Bombs Over Baghdad came out, it was just like a stop the presses moment for me. Like yeah. in the video I mean, that was, that and, and to crazy. watch yeah. both of those guys hit that syncopated flow with a beat like that. Um, and this album is special for me. You know, my career, I had the album early because I was writing for my high school newspaper and they used to send CDs out way in advance. So that was a flex back then. Like, that was a flex. Yo, yeah. I, I remember having, you know, girls and friends in my mom's car long before it was a single playing Miss Jackson. and be like, yo, this is, a, this, this record, this is different. This is great. And then to watch it turn into what it did, um, man, you know, and I, I just think it's a phenomenal album. And what's really dope is, um, you know, Universal's re-releasing it with some remixes and tracks that people haven't heard. And they're then next, you know, this month, November, they're doing it with um, Soul Food by Goody Mob. Um, so, you know, two great Dungeon Family albums. And uh, yeah, I just, it's just 20 year anniversary is a good reason to celebrate. I, it feels like yesterday we ran a 15th anniversary for Stankonia and bam, five years just flew by like that, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, so you mentioned uh, Miss Jackson and bombs over Baghdad, and you put bombs over Baghdad on now, it'll still like just set. No. It's just like it's just incredible, but it's also retro, right? Because it's very African bambata in the yeah. beat. Um, yeah. But uh, so fresh and so clean, incredible record, humble mumble. I mean, there, there's a lot of really great records on that, you know. So, um, yeah. Um, shout out to Outcast. So Will Smith finally uh, talks about, you know, so the rumor has been for years that Summertime was was um, written by Rakim because everything yeah. about it just sounds like the R. Um, and Rakim has denied it to this day, you know, who knows, like, you know, I don't know if they had a, like an ironclad, like uh, NDA, if it would have ever come out. But Will Smith was talking to Snoop and this week, and he said that he did, in fact, like at least write it in the style of Rakim. Like he yeah. was absolutely trying to be like Rakim. So, and, and I'm not sure that that- Do you believe it? Do you believe it? You still think Rakim wrote it? No, I believe it. I believe it. And I don't say that because I'm in, I'm in Philly. Um, you know, I think that you can emulate styles. I think that, you know, early Eminem sounds so much like Master Ace. And I've, I've told Ace that I've never had a chance to tell. Eminem's admitted that, you know, like you can hear your influences at times. And yeah, and I, I saw that clip this week. It was an Instagram live back and forth, which a lot of, you know, top artists have been doing. I, it might have been some weeks back when my man Tony showed it to me. And I thought that was interesting, too, because you had Eric B a few years ago that said that the beat, you know, the... Um, the summertime beat was something that he and Ra like were working on and it made its rounds. And, you know, it's just one of these like legends of hip hop. So for Will to admit like, yo, I was not bite, you know, coming close to biting the flow. Like, yeah, that works. You know, I, I just thought it bring, it brought some cool closure to it. Yeah. I mean, you go back, you listen to old Kendrick, um, like H and I C and dedication. He listen, he sounds very much like Wayne. Mm. You know, yeah. Um, there's a couple songs where it sounds like Jay, but you know, so yeah, artists do from time to time, you know, sound like each other intentionally or unintentionally too, you know, but Rakim or so yeah. Um, uh, and, and Kendrick signed a, a publishing deal. Um, you know, I'm sure he probably had one before, um, or I would think so, but if not, yeah. I'm sure he got a really nice advance for that. I, I'm curious as to whether or not um, this verse and, and that deal portend like a Kendrick release, right? Like, I mean, can you think of any other thing that might threaten Busta for, for album of the year, any other release? It is funny and, you know, I have zero base, you know, but like if Outkast, you know, did something, you know, like you had that like come out of left field, even, in, even Dre, I don't know if like Dre made another album right now, if that would contend, but uh, Kendrick for sure. And Drake has already said, in the last week, if I'm not mistaken, that yo, 2020's off. He's looking at early 2021. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I mean, J Cole moves fast. You know, no. And I really want to see that for Busta. Truly, like I want more dope music. Don't make, but let Busta have a moment. And I right. say that again, full circle, as never being one of those people that was like, oh, you know, let me buy front row seats to a Busta show. Uh, you know, I never went out of my way to buy a ton of his albums that I didn't already get. But this is Busta's moment, and I really want, especially given the theme of the album, for it to be savored. Yeah, it's going to be hard to top this one. Um, so also out on Friday was Common. Uh, the album is a beautiful revolution. I listened to it once, and um, it was actually kind of disappointing. You know, um, it didn't seem like um, he was fully engaged, mm. you know, to me. Even the Black Belt record, you know, didn't really I heard that for me. But. I didn't hear the whole album. I mean, Common is somebody that at various times in my life, especially, you know, in my upper teens, you know, in the somewhere between one day it all makes sense. And, you know, even at B, like Common is somebody who's definitely been at times even in my top five. Like I hold Common in a very high regard. Lately, his music, you know, which I give common credit because every album has its own theme and, and range. It just hasn't been connecting with me. And I wanted to get to a good headspace to, to check this one out, but I, I haven't yet. And, and that even, you know, worries me a little bit some, but I'm going to check it out and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you know if I uh, feel the same or not. Yeah. So um, any other new music you want to talk about from this week? 
No, you know, that's a shout out to Brittany Carter, um, an artist that I have discovered. Thank you to Spotify. And I'm hearing a lot of other like minded fans check out. I mean, just, you know, really dope as we talk about rap and Shade Noir and Meg and so many, you know, women really just commanding the attention right now. She's somebody if you if you like jazz rap, I sent you a song and you can you compared it a little bit to like Slum, Dilla. Um, I encourage everyone to check out her new album, too. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, what's your song of the week? Man, I'm going to go retro. I mean, for all the bust of love, um, I've had a lot of politics on my mind. I've had a lot of personal planning for 2021. I'm going to go with a public enemy classic by the time I get to Arizona. Just mm-hmm. classic, classic PE that I feel like fits a lot of the discourse going on in this country right now. Yeah, it's one of my all-time favorites, man. Um I got to stick to bus to do like, and it's so hard to choose. Uh, I think I'm gonna go with Master Far Muhammad, uh, but it easily could have been Don't Go or, um, you know, the intro or, you know, Look Over Your Shoulder or Deep Thought, like, I mean, but I'm gonna go with Master Far Muhammad. Yeah. Word. Hey, and before we go, I just want to say real quick, you know, rest in peace, John Gamble, um, part of the Stimulated Dummies. You know, Dante Ross has been a great supporter of AFH and, you know, one of hip hop's great producers and A&Rs. And, um, you know, a lot of great stuff for Dell, Brand Nubian, and KMD, all of that. And I didn't see it covered in the space, but I just want to acknowledge that passing. You know, Dante is the lone survivor of those three guys. And, um, you know, just shout out to SD and you know, Dante and, and the rest of, of, of John's collaborators, you're in our thoughts. Yeah, or rest in peace. Oh, man, well, um, you know, the world will have gone, undergone a pretty crazy week next time we, we meet, man. So, you know, stay safe. Um, Likewise, know, man. Stay present, stay, um, you know, you know, maintain perspective. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Keep, uh, what's, what's Kendrick say? And, and Busta, uh, keep looking over your shoulder. Word. Yeah. All right. All right, Reggie. Talk to you.